okay uh good morning uh actually uh, i thought of uh, covering the uh, recent advances topic through faculty lecture i know faculty lecture is not a very popular uh, teaching program uh, people doesn't want to listen to faculty lectures but still uh, i thought that uh, uh, recent advances surgery is one important paper in both ms and dmb examination so if i can cover this uh, topics in faculty lecture through uh, for all these uh, recent advances topic I, I think that will be helpful for your theory exam. So that is the idea of putting uh, all the recent advanced surgery topics uh, in faculty lecture. So I will start this uh, topic with a uh, discussion on necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, let me share my screen. uh there are uh, some recent advances in management of necrotizing fasciitis what i will discuss in details about the uh, pathophysiology the history presentation and recent updates in management of necrotizing fasciitis so uh, what is necrotizing fasciitis it is a rare but it is a severe and potentially life threatening soft tissue infection it can involve the various parts of the body it can involve the scrotum perineum abdominal wall and both the extremities it's a surgical emergency and it is difficult to diagnose unless you have high index of suspicion and early diagnosis and aggressive surgical management is a key to success delay in diagnosis the infection progresses rapidly leading to septic shock and ultimately death this is actually the high in sense of mortality as high as 32% and this is a, a deep tissue space infection involving cellulitis fasciitis myositis lardix angina is a special entity and fauner's gangrene and different comorbidities can worsen the prognosis in necrotizing fasciitis so there is a uh, little about history about this uh, description of necrotizing fasciitis uh, as long as 500 bc hippocrates described the situation of a uh, in complicated erysipelas which resembles the current description of necrotizing fasciitis joseph jones was a military surgeon who gave a first description of modern uh, features of necrotizing fasciitis he has described in 1871 2600 cases of gash gangrene with a mortality of 46% Jean Alfred Fournier was a French dermatologist and venerologist. He described a syndrome with necrosis of the skin of perineum and scrotum in five men, and subsequently this gangrene in the perineum and scrotum was named as Fournier's gangrene. Melanie has described in 1924 association of beta hemolytic infection and infective gangrene, and this entity was then named as Melanie's gangrene. The term necrotizing fasciitis was coined by Dr. Wilson in 1952, and there has been renewed interest in this entity from 1980 onwards. Stephen described 20 patients with septal shock, and out of these, 50 percent diagnosed having necrotizing fasciitis. This disease is popular in the media, saying that these are flesh-eating bacteria. What is the epidemiology? The global incidence of necrotizing fasciitis is. 0.4 to 1 case per lakh population. This is a predilection for men. Fauna's gangrene is more common in men. This can affect all age groups. However, is more in elderly and middle-aged patients. It can involve the lower limbs, abdomen, perineum, and the upper limbs. The mod median mortality ratio is 21 percent, and the range can be as high as 76 percent. Negative fatigue of the extremities. outcome is better than abdomen and perineum non spreading fauner's gangrene is associated better survival however without treatment the mortality of necrotizing fasciitis may be as high as 100% what is the etiology of necrotizing fasciitis trauma is the most common identified etiology surgical trauma for intravenous infection drainage of abscess even minor procedures like iv injection iv cannulation or aspiration may have progression to necrotizing fasciitis 50% patients are apparently 
healthy adult with trivial injuries is more progressive in immunosuppressed patient. There are different intermittent infections which can predispose to enteric fasciitis like appendicular perforation, small gut perforation, necrotizing cholecystitis, small bowel or large bowel perforations. Founders gangrene can occur secondary to some complication of colorectal disease, secondary to anterior infection, isotel abscess, patient undergoing some erythral instrumentation for sick urethra or indwelling foliage catheterization. In omen, Bartholin abscess or valvular skin infection can progress to Faunia's gangrene. In Asia, raw or undercooked food, seafood particularly, and injury by fish fin can be a trigger factor for development necrotizing fasciitis. And in these cases, some marine bacteria are implicated. Other risk factors for necrotizing fasciitis includes use of NSID and steroid. Increased serum creatinine kinase and lactate and decrease of serum antithermal 3 is associated with unfavorable outcome. Other risk factors are systemic acidosis, low hematocrit, low albumin levels. These are all strong association with high mortality. Patients with accompanying disease are more critically ill and there is higher incidence of mortality in these patients. Diabetes is a recent factor. Advanced age is associated with higher incidence and mortality. Patient more than 50 years, mortality is as high as 67%. Advanced age with comorbidity, still higher incidence of mortality. There is no gender variability with mortality. This can be a very acute fulminant infection or this can be a subacute form with slow progression over days. Patient having Faunier's gangrene and extending to the abdominal wall is having a higher incidence of mortality. Different comorbidities are as we necrotizing fasciitis and they also impact outcome of patient of necrotizing fasciitis. What is the pathophysiology of necrotizing fasciitis? This infection begins in the hypodermis and at the beginning, the skin is not involved. These bacteria spreads rapidly along the fascial planes because of release of some enzymes like hyaluronidase from the bacteria. This synergistic action, the virulence factor of the bacteria and specific host factors initiates the pathology of necrotizing fasciitis. This bacterial toxin and enzymes causes necrosis and extension of the infection along the fascial planes. This invasive bacteria can cause thrombosis of vessel hypodermis and leads to tissue necrosis. This tissue necrosis can involve subsequently the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. This spreading bacteria can affect the nerve branches and initially can cause severe pain and ultimately anesthesia. This spread of bacteria is more deeper than to the skin so that the area of skin involvement may not be a reflective of underlying deep tissue damage. However, the lymphangitis and lymphadenopathy are rare due to thrombosis of the vessels. Gas may form in the area because of proliferation of anaerobic bacteria and this anaerobic environment can lead to proliferation of more anaerobic organisms. What are the microbiological flora which cause necrotizing fasciitis? Based on the flora, there has been description of four types of necrotizing fasciitis. In type 1, which is the most common, 70-90% of type 1 necrotizing fasciitis, where this is caused by a polymicrobial flora, which includes Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Enterococci, E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Clostridia. This affects patients more with comorbidities and who are immunosuppressed. This mostly affects the trunk and the perineum. This type 1 infection with this polymicrobial infection causes gross tissue extraction and hypoxia. This hypoxia causes proliferation of anaerobic bacteria. This bacterial toxin also causes neutrophil dysfunction and hemolysis. Type 2 necrotizing fasciitis is caused by 
monomicrobial infection. These are either beta hemolytic streptococcus, streptococcus biogens, or staph aureus. And this staph aureus in 10 to 30 percent cases are methylene resistant staph aureus. This mostly affect the extremities. This can occur following small incision and often as with NSID is used. They can cause toxic shock syndrome because of release of toxins from this bacteria. And this patient outcome is usually unfavorable. In type 3 infections, these are again monomacular infections, but these are specific infections caused by Clostridium species or Vibrio species. The Clostridium infection usually involves the following external injuries, either because of deep wound or crush wounds and surgical wound following surgery for the intestine or some obstetric surgeries. Clostridium perfusion is the most common bacteria of the Clostridium feces. Apart from this, this monomicrobial infection can be caused by Vibrio species. This infection can cause extensive Myonecrosis can cause hemorrhagic blisters and parapodic necrosis and extremely rapid spread of the disease leading to higher incidence of mortality. Type 4 necrosis fasciitis are the fasciitis caused by fungal infections. These are usually infections which can occur in the later part of the disease because of immunosuppression and mostly the aggressive involved candida and other gigamycetes. This clinical course may be very aggressive and this is a aggressive infection more commonly in immunocompromised individual. Microbial diagnosis is possible in 75% cases. Blood culture may be positive in 25% of cases. Debrided tissue may be used for tissue culture and microsexual fungal elements. What are the clinical symptoms and signs of necrotizing fasciitis? Often, the diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis is not straightforward. One needs to have a high index of suspicion for diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. The sign symptom may vary depending on the location and type of infection and associated comorbidities. The symptoms may be either local or systemic symptoms. The local symptoms will vary depending on the site of involvement. And the relative sites of involvement of necrotizing fasciitis involves most commonly the lower limbs, followed by the upper limbs, then the perineum, trunk, and rarely in the head and neck region. So what are the local symptoms and signs? The classical local symptoms of necrotizing fasciitis are local pain. And often this pain is out of proportion to skin involvement. There may be small area of skin involvement, but patient complains of severe pain, which is out of proportion to the skin involvement. There may be local swelling and erythema. There may be local tenderness. Subsequently, in the course of disease, there may be skin necrosis and appearance of hemorrhagic bullying. In case of infection caused by clustering organism, you may find crepitus because of underlying gash. This is a classic appearance of necrotizing fasciitis. You can appreciate the swelling. You can appreciate the erythema and a blister. And more Pertinent is you can see the skin involvement, but the deeper tissue affection may be more than the area of the skin involvement. These are the ecchymosis, blisters and rupture involving the skin necrosis. You see, this is the end stage of the necrotizing fasciitis where you have gross skin necrosis along with underlying swelling and the underlying deep tissue necrosis. What are the systemic signs and symptoms of necrotizing fasciitis? Patient is unwell. Patient may be critically ill. There may be tachycardia, fever more than 38 degrees Celsius. Patient may be in septic shock with hypotension and tachypnea. In fulminant form of the disease, when the disease is progressing, patient is immunosuppressed, patient has other comorbidities. There will be rapid deterioration of the patient. Patient become critically ill and pain in the limb or in the trunk may be out of proportion clinical findings. There may be signs, symptoms of septic shock. Patient may progress to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome and septic shock. There is an entity called subacute form of the disease, where the disease may have slow clinical course. It may endure for days or weeks. 
there is a pain at the site of injury. There will be nerve involvement leading to loss of sensory in the particular area. There will be skin infection in the form of folliculitis or abscess. And subsequently, over days or weeks, patient may have gangrene of the extremities. Patient may have pressure sore or there may be a complicated surgical wound in the form of deep tissue necrosis. What are the different skin involvement in necrosis fasciitis? Initially, when the disease starts, the skin may appear normal. The classical skin condition may take about five days to develop. In the skin, there may be blisters, bully and skin necrosis. Initially, if you find a blister, you can find that this blister contains clear serous fluid. As the infection progresses, this fluid becomes hemorrhagic or purulent. And subsequently, when there is proliferation of gas forming bacteria, you can find the crepitus deep to the skin, particularly infection caused by Clostridium perfusions. The late phase of the disease may be associated signs symptoms of septic shock or MOTS, which is revealed by hypertension, elevated WBC count, metabolic acidosis, coagulopathy, change in mental state. And in the late stage, patient becomes apathetic and indifferent. The prognosis of upper limb necrotic fasciitis is better. And typical feature of necrotic fasciitis may be absent in the upper limb. Patient may appear systemically well. There will be absence of fever in most cases. Several drugs like NSID or steroid may mask fever. However, absence of pyrexia does not necessarily exclude necrotic fasciitis. Faunial gangrene is an entity which is very common in our practice. And this fasciitis in the perineum and scrotum and may also involve the penis. This begins with pain and itching of the perineum and scrotal skin. This can cause necrosis of superficial fascia and fat with thin, watery, malodorous fluid and tepitus. Patient may have high fever. Patient may be ang anxious with altered mental status. Late stages, patient may develop shock, tachypnea, and patient may have bruising, bully, and cutaneous necrosis. This is a classic appearance of founders gangrene, where you find there is involvement, there is erythema, swelling, and there is skin necrosis in the undersurface of the scrotum. This infection may be more progressive, may involve the penis, may involve the perineum, or may involve the lower abdominal wall. There are some parameters to assess faunial gangrene, gangrene severity index because that determines the outcome. Different parameters has been taken into account, but the most sensitive is the serum potassium level and serum bicarbonate level, which can predict outcome of patient with faunial gangrene. So how to diagnose? What are the different laboratory parameters and what are the different investigations which can help us in coming to diagnosis. Most of the cases, necrotic facilities is diagnosed on clinical basis. High index of suspicion is required for that. Investigation should not delay starting management of this patient. Sometimes a simple incision and finger sweep test can give a diagnosis in the bedside. Your finger can be easily passed between the fascial planes and there may be some purulent discharge which classically described as dish, dirty dish water. Classical findings in labor investigation will include WBC count with as high as more than 20,000. There will be alteration of blood and nitrogen and serum creatinine. Serum creatinine kinase is a marker for severe sepsis and MOTS. c reactive protein is a marker for underlying infection. There are some laboratory-based scoring system which helps in early diagnosis of different fasciitis. And this scoring system is taking into account different parameters like CRP, more than 100 given as a score of four, WC count with a count of less than 15,000, 15 to 25, more than 25, hemoglobin level, serum sodium, serum creatinine, serum glucose. Based on this, there is a score from zero to one and two. And based on this, you can classify the patient into different risk groups. 
लो रिस्क ग्रुप्स और पेशेंट हैज गॉट अ स्कोर ऑफ लेस और इक्वल टू 5 मॉडरेट इज 6 टू 11 एंड मोर देन 8 इज हाई सो हाउ डज इमेजिंग हेल्प्स इमेजिंग a plain x ray is not very reliable for diagnosis of nicotinoid fasciitis except in patient who has got gas gangrene where you can see the black shadows in the limbs which suggest the underlying subcutaneous gash which is suggestive of gas gangrene ultrasound is operator dependent but it can show the distorted and thick and fascial planes it can show the underlying fluid collection or an abscess and soft tissue gash may appear in the cryogenic layer i don't have a picture for that ct scan and mri are more sensitive and specific this can show the extent of tissue infection it can show you the fascial swelling and inflammation and underlying gash mri has got a better accuracy than ct scan this is the classic picture of founders gangrene how do you find there is extensive tissue destruction in the scrotum and the perineum with appearance of gash so this is a very specific even if you don't have a, a skin necrosis you can diagnose first founders gangrene based on this mri finding other lab test includes a frozen section biopsy microbiological examination and histopathological examination so what is the bedside test is known as finger test is is a bedside procedure to diagnose necrosis fasciitis under local anesthesia we make a 2 cm skin incision up to the deep fascia and then try to do a gentle probing with the index finger the characteristics of necrosis fasciitis is, is that there will be dirty fluid dirty turbid fluid coming out of the depth of the tissues there will be no bleeding because of thrombosis of the underlying vessels and once you try to push your finger the different the deeper tissue planes the finger will easily go inside because the tissues are necrosed and there is less resistance to the blunt finger dissection so this is a bedside test for founders gangrene or the necrotic fasciitis frozen biopsy is important and helpful for bedside test again it take incision deep up to the fascial level and send this tissue taken from this area for either culture gram stain which are gold standard for diagnosis of nicotinoid fasciitis and hp examination which will show thrombosis of the vessel we show necrosis of the underlying tissue so how do you treat nicotinoid fasciitis as i said early aggressive treatment is very important for outcome of nicotinoid fasciitis you may not wait for the bacteriology report to come back you may not may not wait for the investigation report to come to start your treatment so the first line of treatment for this fasciitis is starting a suitable antibiotic and initially one should go with starting a empirical antibiotic so if you suspect this is a polymicrobial infection your choice should depend on either a combination of ampicillin sulbectam or meropenem with metronidazole or clindamycin and for anaerobic coverage you can start with metronidazole or clindamycin and a imipenem for gram negative coverage initial empiric therapy should be ampicillin sulbectam meropenem piperacillin tazobactam ticarcillin cavulinate or third or fourth generation cyclosporin so at the beginning you don't have a culture sensitive report you should rely on starting the patient on some empirical antibiotic based on the common flora in type 2 disease when you suspect it is either because of streptococcus or staph aureus and if most of the cases are methylene sensitive staph aureus in that case a first or second cyclosporin is good enough for empirical antibiotic for mrsa you should switch on to either vancomycin or dexamethasone or linezolid clindamycin superior to penicillin in streptococcus infection for type 3 infection when there is suspicion of gas gangrene with clostridial infection or vibrio infection in that case clindamycin and penicillin covers well the clostridial infection the vibrio infection is being taken care of by tetracyclines what is the duration of antibiotic therapy usually in necrotizing fasciitis is a prolonged illness and should continue antibiotics till 5 days after local symptoms and signs has resolved and the average duration of therapy 
with antibiotic in this patients are usually between four to six weeks. Newer treatment like intravenous immunoglobulin is coming up in patients with necrotizing fasciitis, particularly with some comorbidities. Type 4, as you said, these are all fungal infections and these are very aggressive disease. And you have to use a specific antifungal agents like amphotericin B or fluoroconazoles. And the treatment is very aggressive and also the uh, patient having immunosuppression, other comorbidities may have worse outcome even with good antifungal agents. Apart from antibiotics, patients should have supported treatment from the beginning. Some of the patient may be in septic shock, so you should resuscitate this patient with adequate fluid replacement. These are the patients who are in very uh, in stress in, uh, in catabolic state and metabolic demands are high and they should be given adequate nutritional support either oral or enteral or if required a parenteral nutrition. Surgical management. This is one of the important prognostic marker for outcome of patient in necrotizing fasciitis. And surgical intervention is described as life-saving. And surgery should be done as early as possible. Delaying surgical treatment may have a fulminant progression of the disease and this infection may prove fatal. Early surgical treatment is indicated in patient having intense pain patient having some skin change like edema and ecchymosis, patient having signs of ischemic blisters and bullying, patient showing uh, systemic signs of organ dysfunction, patient having altered mental status, hypertension, WBC count high. In that case, we should proceed for emergency surgical debridement in the form of local necrosectomy and a good fasciotomy. You should make incision parallel to the Langer's line. Surgery should involve overall tissue debridement. As you debride the tissue and do good a fasciotomy, the spread of infection is halted. The wounds are kept open for free drainage and for additional debridement. Patients should be monitored closely, and they are the patient who may require repeated debridement. These are the different uh, infections where you have done a good amount of debridement, but this debridement may not be adequate on first intervention. These are the patient who may require multiple debridement. You see, they see, they see this wound. On the, on the left side, this wound still contains some devitalized tissue. On the right side, same wound after a few days with further debridement is showing good amount of granulation tissue. This is a patient who has got a infection of the upper limb and a deep fasciotomy. The fasciotomy should be deep, extending beyond the wrist and beyond the elbow. And this decompresses the fascia and you can do an easy debridement. This is a fornuous gangrene. In that case, if the skin involvement is also the penis, you should do an adequate debridement, taking up the whole of the skin and the testis may hang. So, adequate debridement is the key to the success. When you go for debridement in necrotizing fasciitis, keep in mind that this necrotizing fasciitis has different zones of involvement. Zone one is the area of obvious skin necrosis, where you can find the skin is dead, there is fixed discoloration, there is hemorrhagic bullying. This is the zone one of the necrotizing fasciitis. Zone two is the area of early necrotizing fasciitis, where you find the adjacent skin is red and warm. And maybe small serous bully, and the area is extremely tender. And zone three is a normal skin. So, if you know these three zones of involvement while doing debridement, you should be doing a debridement. You see this area. Yeah, there is an area in the around the wrist where you find the obvious skin being black. Adjacent to there, there is the erythema, and beyond that, you have a zone three of normal skin. So once you do fasciotomy or debridement, you see, you have to do the debridement involving the whole area of zone one and zone two. So that is an adequate fasciotomy and debridement. How to do a debridement in the abdominal wall? Abdominal necrotizing fasciitis is a very common entity following surgical 
intervention calling a uh, surgery for intestinal perforations and the post we find the patient has got severe pain abdomen there is induration there is skin erythema so in that case you should go for early surgical debridement and the principle is you should always make a longitudinal incision if required a multiple longitudinal incision you avoid parallel incision because the bridge of the skin between two parallel incision may be debatalized and you should deepen the incision along the muscle and fascial layers until healthy tissue is found deeper extension is more than the skin and there should be an aggressive surgical debridement and post op this patient require repeated dressing change and the advent of vac assisted closure this the wound who can be taken better care by this vac therapy you see in abdomen you should use the incisions and you can go deeper till the deeper fascial layers this necrotic fasciitis from the abdominal wall can spread intra abdominally and may involve the bowel and this infection spread the bowel can cause bowel ischemia lead to perforation peritonitis if the patient has got features of perforated peritonitis there the patient will require urgent laparotomy and this laparotomy and debridement will depend on the extent of surgical uh, extent of the involvement this will involve the debridement of the abdominal wall this will involve the bowel resection and most of the time the other patient where you should not go for a primary resection and anastomosis the other patient where uh, will merit a resection followed by a stoma so you should do the debridement of the abdominal wall and do a resection with the diverting stoma sometime you can go for a hartman's procedure and allow time for the abdominal wall wound to heal maybe a vac assisted closure and then after the abdominal wound is taken care of then you consider closure of stoma at a later date necrotic fasciitis of the axilla is a very uh, life threatening situations where you have very important structures like axillary vessels and the brachial plexus in the axilla and these are very rich in lymphatics also if there is a infection in the axilla they spread very rapidly and once you do a debridement the wide debridement of the axilla exposes the axillary vessels in that case during debridement you take some measures to cover the axillary vessels for to prevent their sloughing off and you should consider wound closure after stabilization of the patient what is vacam assisted wound closure this is a, a newer a gadget in wound management following such large debridement this vac consists of a sterile open cell from sponge and this sponge is cut to the size of the wound which is applied and this sponge is kept in place by a transparent adhesive tray which creates an airtight environment and this sponge has got a connector and this connector is connected by a tubing to a vacuum pump which sucks the exuded from the wound and this evacuation is carried on by the vacuum pump so these are the different components on the on the left upper you find this is a foam sponge this foam sponge is cut to a uh, size of the wound how you like to apply and there is a transparent adhesive tape which comes over this you see on the left lower side we have applied the a uh, foam sponge and there is a transparent adhesive tape which is over the foam to create a negative environment to create a airtight environment and this is connected by a tubing to a vacuum pump and this vacuum pump creates a vacuum in the wound which has got different effects and this vac assisted closure causes early healing of wounds with some mechanisms this is a wound in the upper limb where the vac has been used for about 12 days there is a wound in the abdomen which is a large which is contracted with use of vac therapy
same wound treated with vac therapy so how does a vac helps in wound healing this helps in absorption of excess exudates it has got a wound cleaning effect it reduces the localized edema it hastens formation of granulation tissue and it helps in wound contraction and draws the wound closer each vac application should be changed after 24 to 72 hours depending on the exudates and once this wound starts healing and patient is systemically well we should consider closure of the wound by some form of reconstructive surgery the smaller wounds require regular dressing and may heal the larger wound we can take help of vac dressings and larger wounds the abdomen the extremities we can help take the help of plastic surgeons for coverage by the by skin grafting or by local skin flap what are the future therapies for necrotic fasciitis the use of immunoglobulin is coming up in big way for patient having particularly septical toxic syndrome where the patient has high risk of mortality like advanced age patient with hypertension bacteremia this immunoglobulin can help this patient to tide over this hyperbaric oxygen therapy patient is placed in a oxygen chamber which is more than one atmospheric pressure this results in higher oxygen tension in the tissues and may halt the progression of the disease particularly this reduces the growth of anaerobic bacteria this more oxygen in the tissues can help in angiogenesis however is used in clinical practice is still controversial and is not a uniformly prescribed procedure for all necrotic fasciitis this is a hyperoxygen chamber where you can place the patient and give the hyperbaric oxygen and which has got some beneficial effects this is a, a newer molecule which has been uh, tried in uh, experimental animals is a tissue a uh, collagen binding protein and there is a study in mice which shows this mice survive the streptococcal infection if you are given the calistatin and this calistatin causes increased clearance of immune cells and can take care of the infection this causes enhanced killing of bacteria by neutrophils this also inhibits the uh, immune media mediators like in ten tumor necrosis factor alpha interleukin 1 beta and 6 and this can help in patient having vessel leakage bacteremia and liver pathology however further studies are needed for safe use of this calistatin so what are the prognostic factors for patient having uh, necrotic fasciitis many factor influences outcome which includes virulence of the causative organisms which includes host resistance which includes the underlying comorbidities of the host and the more important is early diagnosis delay in diagnosis is one of the important prognostic factor which is as with poor outcome and aggressive surgical deprivation is one of the important factor for successful outcome so in conclusion necrotic fasciitis is a surgical emergency high index is required for suspicion or diagnosis and often the diagnosis is not straight forward early diagnosis and treatment is the key to success delay in diagnosis and treatment is associated with high mortality aggressive surgical treatment is the key to success newer treatment for this condition is under consideration thank you so you can ask me any question for this clarification because these are i find this is the first topic in uh, ra and this has been described very nicely what the idea is to Uh, just not presenting what is there in the uh, ra i try to include other informations so that this become comprehensive and you can answer any question from necrotic fasciitis okay you should not be you cannot write so much in uh, exam it is a 10 marks question but if you are given a particular suppose you given the uh, treatment for necrotic fasciitis so you should start with the empirical antibiotic treatment then antibody based on sensitivity surgical deprivation extent of deprivation then wound closure systemic treatment newer treatment so you can just have some uh, points like that 
So what I'm trying to say is, uh, if you go through this series of lectures, your coverage for recent advance will be there. So you can have all the topics being covered with the recent advance. So any question from anybody? Any question? Any question in chat box? No. Who are there? <clears throat> Dr. Bhatia, any comment? Yes, Seth. Thank you for your elaborated and nice presentation. I have one question. Yes. So local anesthesia, is it required in each and every cases as because the most of the cases comes to us is late. If it comes late, whatever you said, the index test. So that is the new thing. What? Yes, it is good enough. But is it required to give anesthesia, infiltration yeah. anesthesia? Yeah. If, if you are doing it, this bed size finger test, uh -huh. uh, it is better to, because these are uh, areas, some areas are very... Uh, Extremely Painful. tender. Yes, tender. So, so a small area, just two centimeter area, you infiltrate and put your finger. Is it just a test? It is not okay. a classical deployment. This okay. is a bedside okay. test for diagnosis of metronic fasciitis. However, you made a small incision, put your finger, you find there is a dirty water coming out. And if you put your finger, you find the finger is going to the fascial layers without resistance. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but deployment will be under regional anesthesia. Any, any deployment, yeah. a major deployment yeah. has to be done under anesthesia, either regional or general anesthesia. Can we prevent the recurrence? Suppose it was in the perineum initially, it will progress to the lower abdomen. So can the initial deployment, if we uh, uh, can be, that is prevented, that initial deployment can prevent the further progression of the disease? Yeah, the, the principle of deployment is you keep on dividing till you find normal healthy tissue. Okay. Sometimes you can do little less, but in that case, you should have a second look within 24 hours. After 24 hours, take the patient back to theater and do a uh, repeat debridement. So the, the principle of debridement is you keep on dividing till you reach normal healthy tissue, which is bleeding. So that way, if you've done a good debridement and the fascial spaces are opened up, there is less chance of this being spreading to the distant side and more so patient is in antibiotics. Okay. So the Thank key to success is the adequate deployment in the first sitting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for your nice presentation and elaborate presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Sir. Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask just uh, how to uh, suspect uh, that a patient might have uh, uh, might have ne uh, necrotizing fasciitis or it is progressing to, uh, you know, four years gangrene because I was a first year resident when I saw this first case and I could not pick it up and it... Uh, there was just a mild pain in the uh, testis and scrotum region, which developed into full-blown uh, necrotizing fasciitis of the lower abdomen and four years within 48 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I said is that the first thing is, uh, once you find a patient who has got pain in the perineum or the scrotal area, a high index of suspicion is important. So you have a high suspicion this patient might go to necrotizing fasciitis, that is one. Second is, if you go to the pain history, you will find there is not much of skin changes. There is not much of sign. The pain is out of proportion. So somebody complaining of pain out of proportion to the clinical sciences presentation, you should suspect something is wrong in the deeper areas. And these are the patient who may have extreme tenderness in the local site. And tenderness is out of proportion beyond your skin involvement. You find there is no skin involvement at the beginning. But still, patient has got extreme tenderness. And there may be local edema or sclerosis. And some of the patient may have some systemic symptoms. Patient may have fever. Patient may have leukocytosis, increased CRP. 
So once you have high index of suspicion, before you find patient has got skin involvement, you can give an early incision. An early incision in this phase, if you see a patient has got pain and then you have made a small incision in the beginning, this full-blown picture may be halted or maybe even prevented sometimes. So index of suspicion, pain history, tenderness, and some systemic uh, signs and symptoms can lead you to the diagnosis. Thank you, sir. Very, what is mortality? Yeah, you see, mortality rate is variable. As I said, it can be anything between 10% uh, to 70%. And the mortality is dependent on number of factors. A Faunia's gangrene patient has high mortality if the infection spreads to abdominal wall. Patient having a uh, infection which is not being treated, the mortality is 100%. So early antibiotics, early surgical deployment is associated with better outcome. The as such, as such, if you analyze the different series, the necrotic fascia in your upper limb, the results are very good. Faunia's gangrene without spread to the abdominal wall, the prognosis is good if you do early deployment. So the mortality is variable because this can be a disease which is associated with a aggressive uh, Invasion of the infection, particularly in immunosuppressed patient and patient with other comorbidities, where mortality is higher. So mortality is variable, any year between 10 to 70 percent. Neglected patient, no, no, it's not always neglected patient. Suppose you have done a surgery for uh, uh, abscess drainage and the abscess is drained. Subsequently, find this is in the infection which is progressing in the deeper tissues. So it's not always a neglected patient. Sometimes a, a healthy patient, a healthy patient with trivial injuries may have necrotizing fasciitis. So it's not always a ne neglected patient, the disease may be progressive. A, a, a classic attack of necrotizing fasciitis can occur in a otherwise healthy adult with some minor injuries, like IV cannulation, like a, a simple foliage catheterization this patient may have necrotizing fasciitis. So this is not always a neglected patient. It can be a, a situation of a otherwise healthy patient with minor intervention may develop necrotizing fasciitis. We should always keep in mind these possibilities. Yes, sir. Yeah. sir, how, how will we be sure that uh, the, the level of, uh, the, the amount of debridement that is done is enough? Because since it is not a very obvious or in the superficial, uh, like in the skin. Yeah, you, you see, the principle of debridement is one is you can identify the necrotic tissue by gross appearance, number one. And once you're cutting through the tissues, the dead tissue will not bleed. The important point to find that you have done adequate debridement is you have reached the bleeding tissues. Once you start incising, the area is bleeding. You stop debriding there. And more so is if you are not sure they have done adequate debridement. There is always a role for second look operation. You do a debridement, you at least decompress the tissue, you debride the grossly necrotic tissue, and then take the patient back to OT again after 24 48 hours. So, some of the patient may require repeated debridement. It's not that one debridement is good enough. It's not wise to do a heroic debridement in, in, in one go. You do a debridement, the infection is partly taken care of and do a repeat debridement up to 24 hours or 48 hours. So what is the ideal time to uh, go for debridement? Sometimes we find there is total edema and it is a uh, necrotizing debridement. Uh, it, it is said that, I said that once you have diagnosed a faunial gangrene with the induration and the tenderness and the pain, the ideal time is within 12 hours. Of diagnosis. You should not delay. So more you delay, the infection spreads to the fascial planes and the necrosis is more. So once the idea of decompression is you open the tissue planes, the bacterial invasion will be halted. The necrosis will be halted. So you can go for surgical deployment within 12 hours of diagnosis as early as possible. Suppose patient comes with the picture I've shown, already the skin is dead. So 
do a resuscitation and take the patient to theater as early as possible. Sir, uh, those which are attending, uh, we have seen a few cases. Pony again has ended up to the uh, upper abdominal, yeah. to the upper limbs. In those cases, how to manage? Multiple stab? Not stab. We, you see, these are the patients who are very uh, critically ill. Patient having a faunus gangrene spread in the abdomen, these are the patients who are immunosuppressed. These are the patients who might be uncontrolled diabetic. These are the patients who has got uh, uh, other comorbid illness like liver failure or chronic renal failure. So the idea of treatment in such situation is good and adequate deployment. And the principal event in the abdomen is put multiple vertical incisions up to the deep fascia. And if you find that the infection is spreading deeper, you have to go deep. So the idea of this abdominal spread is antibiotic is a part of treatment. Antibiotic is not going to take care of this dead tissue. So the main principle of treatment is adequate incision and deployment. So if there's influence in the abdominal wall, you put multiple vertical incision deep up to the fascia. Okay. Sir, so why vertical incision, sir? Uh, you see, if you make a vertical incision, you can reach the large area of the abdomen. If any horrency on you are reaching the lower part of the abdomen, and you can make multiple vertical incisions. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So you can close. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you.